guys, this is Pastor Jim. And this is Seth. Welcome, Welcome to, to Primary Camp Meeting. When I am afraid, I will trust in you, and it's in your word that I pray. Amen. Two boys work in their family's business. Caleb helps on a strawberry farm. Neftali, he works in his family's bake shop. So Caleb, I hear you're gonna help us with some gardening. Can you show us what kids can do in the garden? You're gonna show us what kids can do maybe with some firewood, that's on here. And you also are on one of the one great strawberry farms. So I think we're gonna plant some things too. Are you gonna show us how to do that? All right, I'm looking forward to it. Let's do it. are at Caleb's grandma and grandpa's house. Let's talk about what you're going to do here. I'm going to pick lettuce and transplant some plants. I'm transplanting plants and what I'm doing right now is putting this into here which will help the plants grow and then we'll need some water to help water. To give it water. It's like a potting soil. Get some got some extra vitamins in that one, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Plant right there. Yeah. Giving them a little more space to grow, I think. Is that right? Yep. So, so you're transplanting some plants, and what kind of plants are they? Pepper plants. Uh, hot ones, or green peppers, or maybe they are ghost peppers. 
I think they're green peppers. They look like green peppers. There's a bell pepper. I'm going to use this pencil to make a hole and press the drill a little bit. So Caleb, what's the, what's this all about? This is pine needle leaves and maple leaves, and it's good for blueberries because we have blueberries. It's good for blueberries. I like blueberries. Today we're going to visit an eight-year-old boy who's helping with his family's bake shop. Between a 
donut and a muffin. Yes, they are. Oh. Shortbread cookies, and then there's the vanilla ones. Right what is that? Vanilla um, shortbread cookie. I'll help you know. So these are shortbreads. Yes. And strawberry, chocolate, orange, and, and vanilla and with cinnamon. cinnamon. Ah. And the ones in the end are called stones because they look like stones. Do they taste like stones? No. No. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Oh, I thought that you liked this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and this looks familiar. Churros? Churros! But with um, strawberry in it. Oh, strawberry churros. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Um, Papa, ¿qué son? ¿Qué son estos? ¿Qué son estos? They're called Panfino. Panfino? Um, Which one's the bananas? Oh, oh my. They're like little pies triangular. Look and at they... this. Look at this. this is... What are they again? Um, empanadas. Math, it's like reading, 
I'm trying to be practiced more, and get better. I can have anything more. That's cinnamon. That. That's cinnamon. No, that's orange. We're gonna make rolls. orange rolls with that. That's why it has so orange zest. So we have the here. I just know it pops this bubble. <laughs> Not a bubble bubble. No? Yeah. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Keep going. Caleb showed us how to put plants in the ground and make our very own garden. Neftali, he showed us how to make donuts and bread, but do you remember what he said? He said the same thing that's said in John 6, 35. Jesus is the bread of life. Hey guys, let's go see Marilee's museum.
want to talk to you a little bit about fossils. We were going to talk about fossils and about what scientists are finding around about fossils. You know, people use fossils as an example of evolution. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's no such thing as evolution. All we have to do is look around, again, at the earth and the things that God has preserved that tell us the story of his creation and the story of the flood. So sometimes when I'm in places in the world where I can't find shells, I start looking for rocks. Well, I have a couple of examples. When we were in Nepal working at the Shear Memorial Hospital, there were some people on the road and they were breaking up rocks. Now in these rocks, if they found, took and broke a rock open and found something interesting, they kind of pitched it aside and then they sold it to tourists like me. So I got the rocks, opened them up, and look at the pattern inside of the rocks. This is inside of a rock. Here's another rock. Look at there, inside of a rock. This has come out of the mountains. This has been washed down the stream in a gully from the Himalaya mountains. Just uh, totally amazing. Now this is on the Nepal side. So you can see these are dark and black and they just keep chipping and chipping and they're actually making aggregate for concrete. And they sit there all day long and chip rocks for a dollar a day. 10 hours a day. You know, count your blessings. Yes. So then I traveled, had the privilege of traveling to the other side of the world. Now this is on the other side of the Himalayas. We went in search, we didn't get to, but we went to look at Mount Everest from the other side. And so while we were there at a base camp, I was looking around, and guess what I spotted? A rock. And in the rock, look at that. Now what does that look like? What does that remind you of? That's the chambered nautilus, God's fossils from the flood that's been there since the flood. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about this shell. We call this God's submarine. Now actually, this is a mollusk, but it's in a class all by itself because it's really special. This is one of the most intelligent shells in the ocean. When you open up this shell, you will see little tiny chambers. And the animal lives in these chambers and he, as he grows, his shell grows. So. What happened during the flood, when God destroyed the earth by a flood, what happened to all these shells and things? That's why we're seeing all these fossils everywhere in the world. See this here? This is a chamber nautilus. You can see again the chambers. Some of these chambers, the reason I like this one is because the chambers are hollowed out. What has happened is that because of the, whatever happened in the earth during the flood, you know, all the pressures and all the moving around and everything like this. All these fossils got moved around. But these little chambers here got filled with water probably, and then as the water evaporated, crystals were formed. It's kind of the same way like in a cave. When you go into a cave and some of them have these beautiful crystals that are formed, it's because of the minerals and things that are in the earth and the water, and as it dried out, after the flood, the crystals grew. Just like today, they're still growing. So anyway, when you see a nautilus, you think, God, God preserved that for us. He wants us to know that he did destroy the earth with the flood, but he's coming again and making the earth all new. These two things are the same thing. Uh -huh. This is one that you got that is now, now and one that's petrified. Yes. Well, then, a little closer to home, there are fossils, you know, right here in Minnesota, but under your feet. I could show you some. I wish I would have brought some that my grand grandson has collected. But I have a friend who went out into the Red River Valley over along in the, on the west edge of Minnesota in the river. And in the dry, he walked out into the field and he started looking for geodes. And guess what he found? Look at this. And look at this. There is that same Nautilus right here in Minnesota. Isn't that amazing? And God has that there for us to find, to discover under our feet, 
all these things and all they're saying to you is I love you you can see that I love you I care about you I'm planting these evidences for you to you to so you know that my word is true and so that's just some more fossils I want to show you okay now we'll go upstairs and find some other ones something like septuagen or septurian stone and what it actually is is it's a mud ball sure. it's mud that's been from the flood from the flood it's mud okay the spark of the interior because of the you know the heat or, or the water or whatever from the flood that formed this type of rock actually they formed a rock well, the round, kind of round. This has been polished off. The interiors that are black are from Madagascar. The interiors that are the light colored uh, facets are from Idaho. Only two places in the world where they're from. This is a great big one here. This is actually one of the bigger, this is an example of one of the biggest pleurotomeries, and this comes from Japan. So they're in all the waters, all the seas. So here again, to me it shows the proof of the creation of the flood. Because how can the same species of shell be in one ocean and in the, on another ocean? All, all, all in these different seas, but yet they're same families, different species. So this was hanging around this little shop and I was looking around and I, Stone. They had this whole shop full of this stones, all kinds of stones. And both of these stones I bought from there. And so I went and got Denzel. He was someplace. I'm like, Denzel, come look at these rocks, you know. And he says, Oh, I thought that was a bunch of meat hanging on that store. And I said, No, the rocks, Denzel. <laughs> and that was in China, or it was in China, in, in way in inland China. Huh. But it's here again. It's a flood. It's just layers that have come down through the earth, you know? It's just amazing. If you can't, if you can't come away with looking at stuff and not believe in creation, right? This is a specimen of a heteromorph, another form of ammonite. This is a fossil of an ammonite that came from Madagascar. There are more fossils found in Madagascar than any place else in the world. And I put the cell phone down there so you can get a little comparison. But this ammonite is 24 inches across. Can you imagine that shell before the flood? Erythium, a seraph. And I, I and this is the shell today. This is the shell today. This is how big it is. And this is the fossilized form of the seraph. Okay, let me make sure I got that right. That little shell is... This little shell is what this is today. This is the fossilized. So the one before the flood was bigger. Oh, yeah, like the mat, like the ammonite over there. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So this is, of course, a trilobite. Is that a fish, a trilobite? No, or is it's, a, it like it's, a, a, it's like a, a bug. It's a bug. Is, yeah. is it a sea bug or a... No, I, I think it is. I think it's kind of like a... Oh, it's a type of a worm, like a polyphene or something. I don't know. There's another fossilized nautilus. These actually came out of South Dakota when I was at a little rock shop in South Dakota. There's a fish. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another piece of Nautilus. Oh, there's a big trilobite. The sea stars. Yeah. The smaller ones just came out of Europe. Fossils in South Dakota, little stuff in South Dakota. 
Isn't that amazing? And God has that there for us to find, to discover, under our feet, all these things. And all they're saying to you is, I love you. You can see that I love you. I care about you. I'm planting these evidences for you, to you to, so you know that my word is true. Whatever happened in the earth during the flood, you know, all the pressures and all the moving around and everything like this, all these fossils got moved around. God, God preserved that for us. He wants us to know that he did destroy the earth with the flood, but he's coming again and we're making the earth all new. Hi, boys and girls. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a country off the east coast of Africa. The third largest island in the world is called Madagascar. Mm -hmm. The king in the uh, 15th century, mm -hmm. that king who gave the name of Antananarivo, mm -hmm. the name ah. of the capital town. Antananarivo, it means the city of 1,000 soldiers. Ah. Yes, but it is also the second name of uh, the capital town. Before that, it was Analamanga. Analamanga, it means the blue forest. Yeah. That name was uh, given by the aboriginal people. In Madagascar, many families earn less than six dollars, the equivalent of six dollars a month. And they are to feed their families and, and live off of that. Think about that. spent six dollars today just being at your house <laughs> and so it's one of the poorest countries in the world but some of the finest people I've ever met are from there as well a historian told us that 56% of the population of Madagascar is 26 years old or younger. 26 years old, they, they may have, uh, here in the States, may have finished college. That's a pretty young country. That's full of young people there. The life expectancy is 66 years old, which is, is not terrible for Africa. At 66 years old, that's barely one of your grandma's age. One of the stories I want to share with you is about a church who prayed. They really wanted to have a building to worship God in on the Sabbath day. There are many Seventh-day Adventist churches in Madagascar, in part thanks to help from Minnesota, the One Day Church Project. We send buildings, churches, and school buildings, and hospital buildings there because people are very generous and help us to do that. And once they arrive in Madagascar, they're able to put them up by a trained crew of construction workers, and they do an excellent job. It's one of the true stories that came back to us was at Antisarabe, where the church fasted and they prayed. These people gather together as a group of young believers, Seventh-day Adventist believers, they gather together and they decided we need a new church. They thought, well, the only way we're going to receive a new church is if we fast and we pray for this new church. 
miraculously, they, their prayers were answered and we were able to send them a one day church building. But part of that process is they need to finish it. They need to put a floor in it and they need to put some walls on it, which isn't very expensive in Madagascar to do. But everything seems expensive when you're very poor and don't have many means and, and sometimes not much work to do to earn means. And so they decided at the beginning of each week, they would fast, they would go without food, and they would pray. And they did that. They did that for several months. And while they did that, they set aside the money that they saved from not eating. Now, mind you, they don't eat very much there anyhow. They're very, uh, very poor, and it's hard, to, it's hard to eat a lot. And so they set aside the money they saved from not eating and fasting, to build and finish the church. These are pretty common stories of people dedicating and giving up uh, things that you and I would take for granted in order that they can have a house of worship. They were starting with the prayer and fasting and then special offering to raise funds. They have been praying uh, earnestly uh, to build the church since they already have land from donated by one of the members. Uh, uh, it was February 2017 when they came to build this. Since we have the building, we also started the evangelization. Amen. Yeah, we get more baptism. Uh, we have about 65 members uh, attending this church now. Now I want you to think about it. Are you willing to, to uh, deny yourself something? Maybe uh, some Legos here in the States or maybe even lunch money in order to uh, help others build a church of worship or a school or a hospital building? Something to think about, isn't it? Hey, it's time for Peg Doll's Bible Biography with Pastor Ken. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pastor Ken with another story about Elijah. And today, we are reading from chapter 19 of 1 Kings from the New American Standard Bible. The sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And then the hand of Yahweh was on Elijah, and he outran Ahab to Jezreel. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message for Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life
and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it is enough now, O Yahweh, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of Yahweh came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. And so he arose and ate and drank. And went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God, which is Mount Sinai. And then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. And so he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh was passing by. and breaking in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave and behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And then he said, I've been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. Then Yahweh said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel, king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes the sword of Jehu 
Elisha shall put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And so he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. You know, sometimes we might get discouraged just like Elijah did. And just like he went jogging to the junipers and was feeling so sorry for himself, we might feel the same way, but God is with us all the while. He'll send his angel to be with us and to help us, even if it means running a little bit more away from God, but he'll eventually put us back to work for him. Aren't you glad that, he's, that we serve a God like that? It's recap time, and what kids can do, I guess it's never too young to be able to help out around the house. In Marilee's museum, we see that fossils are kept around by God so that we know his words are true. In the Madagascar Mission Project, hmm, would you be willing to give up a meal to build an entire church? Huh, I guess I would. In Peg Doll Bible Biographies, Elijah gets overwhelmed with fear, and he runs from Jezebel. <sighs> well, at least he got to meet God again, and God talked to him, and maybe this time he'll muster up some courage and go confront his fears. I'll see you next time, and God bless.